Amen. Hello and welcome to Highland Country Fellowship. Uh, really glad you're here. The uh, last few days of October and winter has set in. And I've got out my winter Hawaiian shirts. I'm all ready for it. Uh, hey, if we have not yet met, my name is Bill Rector. And I am delighted to be the teaching pastor here at Highland Country Fellowship. And some of you are visiting. Maybe you've only been here a couple of times. I know one of my former students is actually here. And I don't know, maybe she's taken off for the hills already. I don't know. But, but uh, 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 Alex, if you're here, would you? Oh, there she is. One of my former students there. So you can ask her. She seems to be recovering nicely from being in my tutelage for so long. Uh, the stutter's almost completely gone. And there's no more drooling at all. And I think it's, uh, I think it's wonderful. It does, it, it, you know, I always told them, you'll get over it. And it's taken her nearly 20 years. But she seems to be over. Uh, where was I? Uh, if you are visiting with us, I hope you always experience three things at this church. And the first is just the, the fellowship and the friendly people that are full of the Holy Spirit of God. And when we get together, it's, it's palpable, it's real. And if I haven't gotten a chance to meet you, I hope you've gotten a chance to meet so many of the bright, shining faces here that brighten my week and this morning. And then the second thing I hope you experience is how we take that fun and fellowship and, and God and these gifted ministers turn it into worship. The fun we have together gets taken into the throne room of God and fellowship becomes worship. And, and now the third part of that that I hope you see is that while we are there, while we're worshiping the Lord, we read verse by verse his ideas that change our hearts and change our minds. It is not me that can do that. It is the word of God. But it is my privilege to get to read that to you and chunk it out at you and let God do with you what he will. And we are in the 22nd chapter of Luke. And I'm going to begin in the 19th verse here. If you'd like to follow along in your Bible, Luke 22, 19. And I think we have all these verses up there today. And it goes a little bit like this. This is our story. And he took bread gave thanks and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. But the hand of him who is going to betray me is with mine on the table. The Son of Man will go as it has been decreed, but woe to that man who betrays him. They began to question among themselves which of them it might be who would do this. And also a dispute arose among them as to which of them was considered to be the greatest. And this, beloved, is the word of the Lord. And the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. And the events that we have described here are depicted in perhaps the most famous Christian artwork of all time. Leonardo da Vinci's The Last Supper captures this very event that I've described to you. Da Vinci wanted to capture the moment that the news that there was a betrayer was revealed and the ensuing chaos. Um, this, uh, again, I, I don't know if this is the most famous or most recognizable piece of Christian artwork. It is among da Vinci's biggest um, I can tell you a few things about it. And you know that I like artwork here, so I, I'm, I, hope, I hope this doesn't bore you. Um, this was originally painted in 1495. Uh, and I, Sammy, I think, was helping with the oil at that point. Just 1495. It's, on, it's in a monastery in Milan, Italy, the uh, Santa Maria del Grazi. See, I can pronounce foreign words. I just don't always want to. Uh, which means the Saint Mary or Holy Mary of Grace. And it was a monastery in Italy. Now, it seems like it's really big here. Well, it's nothing. The real painting is 15 feet tall and 30 feet across. It's amazing. I actually have a picture of, if you were to go, this is a picture taken from the mural in Milan, Italy. If you were to go to that, I think they only give you about 20 minutes to view. And some of you have done this. Now, it's a couple of you are raising your hands that maybe you've done this. It, it must be amazing because I think I could stare at this for more than 20 minutes. I think I might just get back in line and do it again. But to accommodate all the visitors, that's all they allow. 
I have to tell you something about this. It, uh, the painting has not fared well on the wall of the monastery. Uh, you can see they actually cut a door in the bottom of it at one point. Before this became the most famous work of art, it was in the way, and they just needed to cut a door through it. Uh, and and, and it, it's, uh, it, it also, uh, even though millions of people have seen it, and there's just no question about da Vinci's genius, this was kind of an experiment that he tried. Um, typically, uh, uh, something like this, he would have painted a, a fresco. A fresco is a situation where you, you either mix the paint in with the plaster, and then you plaster the wall, and it's stuck up there, or while the plaster's still wet, you put a paint on it. That's, that's the way these Renaissance masters did a lot of these big works. Well, da Vinci wanted to experiment with oil painting, a tempera paint. And so he had a flat, dry, wooden surface, and he tried to paint oil on it. And, and it was an experiment, and I hate to say this because I don't want to take away from da Vinci's genius, but it just failed. Within the first generation of this painting, it was flaking off and it was coming apart. So I don't want to hurt your feelings, but if you've actually been to see this, that's really not the original. There have been seven renovations that have taken place of this because of, of, uh, of how, how much it fell apart. And by the way, it, were, it wasn't just the monks that didn't respect for it. It turns out this monastery has not been a, a great home for this work of art. In addition to them cutting a door in it, that just seems crazy, doesn't it? But they did that in about 1650-something. So 150 years into the life of this painting, eh, we need to get through there. We're just going to cut a door out of Jesus' feet and nobody will notice. But Napoleon used it as a barn for his horses. Yes. <laughs> yes, he did. And, 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 and his soldiers damaged it really badly. And then, of course, the, the Nazis bombed this area of Milan, and whether they intended to or not, they're rotten people, they might have intended to, whether they did or not, the building was nearly destroyed and the wall was shaken and much of the paint came off. So there's seven restorations, one as late as 1978, that make it look like this. Now, I will tell you this, you might consider this a bit of divine inspiration, but uh, da Vinci knew that his experiment had failed. And so in 1520, 25 years after he painted it, he took three of his best students and he had them copy this, which is why we have such a great idea of what the original looks like. So this clean copy that I'm going to show you, which is the next one here, this is a high-resolution photograph of one of his students' copies made in 1520. So I think the reason, that's, that's why clearly this is not what you'll see because there's no hole cut out of Jesus' feet. But this to me is the best representation, representation we can get of the original intent. And there's another thing that helped us with this. And that is Da Vinci, you may know this, kept a notebook. It's, his notebook is almost famous now with inventions that look like helicopters and, and drawings that never made it to artwork. In his notebook, he detailed the things he did and the positions and how he made this painting which really helps us get an idea. So I, I, the original is really all but lost. There's very little, if any, of the original that remains. But the original idea has been captured, I think, faithfully here because of that. I hope that makes sense. So one of the things that we don't have to guess, as you can see, that in this painting we have the apostles. We have 12 of them sitting, and you might wonder who's who. You don't have to wonder. He wrote it in his notebook. So let's go through them. Actually, this is not from his notebook, but this is notes that was taken off of another one of the copies. Starting from right to left, right? I'm sorry, let's go from left to right. That's the way we read things, isn't it, right? I was getting a little Hebrew on you there for a minute. Uh, from, from left to right, Bartholomew is over there on the far end of the table. James Minor, well, that, that means, you know, sometimes that means the younger James. In this case, this is James, the son of Alpheus as you might read through your list of apostles, right? Um, Andrew is the older guy, and you can see he's, he's kind of next to Peter here, and his hands are up. He's in a little bit of shock. That was Peter's brother. Peter is there right next to Judas, and he's kind of leaning over in from Judas. So you have Peter, who's the oldest one pictured there. Then Judas. Can you see Judas okay there in that? I mean, some of you... I'm going to try and help. Judas would be right there and right here, okay? Um, 
And then it says, John, not Mary. Uh, we don't always have to do that when you're writing an address to someone, say, deliver this to John, not Mary. But a controversy has arisen because a particular habit of Renaissance paintings is prepubescent young men, teenage boys, were often painted to look a little bit more feminine. And da Vinci was, I don't know if he had a gender issue or not, I really don't, but in many of his paintings, he exaggerated the lines, he blurred the lines. Uh, if you ever looked at the Mona Lisa, the Mona Lisa looks a little masculine, to the point where some have even theorized that it was a self-portrait of him. I, I don't believe that, I think that's just a style that he painted. So he doesn't just paint a little femininity, John, in this painting is really very feminine looking, but, but so, is, so is Philip, honestly. So I think that was the style of the day. I think it was the style of da Vinci. And about every 50 years, someone will trot out a conspiracy theory and they'll sell a few thousand books uh, about how that was Mary Magdalene. Uh, art, you know, his notebook says it's not. The history, tradition, there's absolutely no evidence it was anyone other than John. So the author of this went out of his way to say, that's John, not Mary. And I, okay, I like that. Um, then, of course, there's Jesus. There's Thomas. And you can see Thomas has got this great expression there with his finger up, which is really, really interesting. Uh, some say that that, that is a, uh, Aristotelian, that that marked uh, Aristotle. It was almost as though he was questioning the scientific things that were going on. Um, and then we, we, we see... Uh, James Major, that's James, John's older brother, James and John, right, the sons of Zebedee. And then you see uh, Philip, um, and Philip is portrayed a little bit uh, like, a, like a younger person. Matthew, Thaddeus, uh, Thaddeus is better known to us as Judas, the son of James. In your Bible, if you read the, the, the names of the 12, it really just depends on which version you're in as to whether he's uh, uh, Ju the other Judas. Remember, there were two Judases and two Simons there. One Judas was the son of James, and that's the one we see there that's called Thaddeus. And then the other Simon is Simon, who we would know as Simon the Zealot. So there they are. Now, um, let's, let's go back to that clean copy, if we can, the one that, that we... Uh, there's a lot that, that I, I, I don't even think you'll be able to see here, but there's a few things I want to note about it. And I, I, they're, they're, these aren't necessarily biblical points, but while we got it up there, I just the teacher in me can't resist here. Uh, there's really very little chance that they sat at a big table and chairs. That's just not historically accurate. Uh, there's no, there's, uh, the best evidence we have is that at that time they would have reclined. They, they might have still had a table, but even Luke tells us in verse 14, verse 14 of this chapter that they were reclining at the table. So it, it wouldn't have looked like tables and chairs like this. It probably would have had some table that was much lower to the ground but it, it, they would have been almost like on, on, on pads or cushions where their feet would have been extended away from the table and their head would be there. If you walked in on the scene, it might look like a bunch of college kids in bean bags playing Monopoly, right? Where they're kind of on the ground and the center of it is clearly here at this table, but they're just kind of reclined and their feet are away. There's just no, almost no chance it would have looked like this, but for da Vinci, uh, there's he must have known that, or he certainly might have known that, but he still might have painted it anyway this way because it gives him the artistic license that he needs to paint all 12 of them. That's difficult to know. His, his notebook doesn't even say that. So he might not have known that. The one thing that I like, and this is the former math teacher in me, is that there's a whole lot of intentional geometry that is built into this painting. You can see it's, it's three-dimensional, and you can see how it kind of goes into the background. If you've ever taken an art class, you'll know that they have these uh, pers lines of perspective, they're called, uh, and, and they focus at one point kind of called a vanishing or a dimension or a focus point. Well, uh, if we can see the next one of these, it, uh, you can kind of see that da Vinci made Jesus the vanishing, the focal point of all the lines of dimension in this photograph. You can see the dotted lines, and as he was painting it, he actually, and this is in his notebook, he actually took a nail and put it into where he would paint the head of Jesus. And he had strings that went out to help him get these lines. And I hope you can see the effect. Maybe if we can go to the next one and maybe toggle, toggle back and forth a little bit if you can, Julie. You can kind of see how that effect, it, it doesn't just put Jesus in the center of this painting. It, it, it creates something where you're being drawn into the center of this. I hope you can see that. Um, so... 
well, it, it, it not only does that, but that, that dimension has these things kind of coming out at us. It, without 3D glasses at the time, this was the best that anyone could do to kind of have this jump out at you. And, and you could see all of the bread and the cups are on the end of the table. So what, what da Vinci is trying to do by this is, is kind of put this out at you, almost to invite the viewer to partake in the Lord's Supper here. Uh, and and that, that was part of his intent by the, the dimensions of this. Uh, he, he was definitely trying to capture this moment that we just read about, the moment where Jesus says someone's going to betray me and then the argument and the chaos that ensues. Um, there's so many things we could show you. There's just one thing I'd like to zoom in on and show you a little bit, and that is the reaction around there's Judas, there's Peter, there's John, not Mary, right? Uh, Judas, Peter, John, not Mary. Um, I hope you can see that the right hand of Jesus is reaching for bread and going to dip it in there. And the left hand of Judas is reaching for the same thing. And both of their hands are open. And, and it's, 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 it's like an action-oriented thing. And this sets up this idea that the hand of him who is going to betray me is with mine on the table. And, and I think um, in John's gospel, this is even more powerful. John points out that this, this is actually a, uh, it's a fulfillment of scripture. In, uh, and we've got these verses. I'll come back to this in a second. Uh, I, I'm not referring to all of you, John 13, 18. I know those I've chosen, but to fulfill the scripture, he who shares my bread has lifted up his heel against me, is a direct quote of Psalm 41, 9, which says, even my close friend whom I trusted, he who shared my bread has lifted up his heel against me. So this is one of those things that what's going on here at this dinner is a fulfillment of prophecy that's at least 1,000, maybe 1,500 years old. This depiction uh, that we saw of Judas and Peter leaning over is really not so much Luke's version of the, this account. It's, it really much more uh, reflects John's account of this. So let's just go on to John, chapter, or John 13, verse 21. After he said this, Jesus was troubled in spirit and testified, I tell you the truth, one of you is going to betray me. His disciples stared at one another at a loss to know which of them he meant. One of them, the disciple whom Jesus loved, that's John, the gospel writer. He did not like to write his own name in as, as this. Out of anonymity and out of humility, John referred to himself as someone that Jesus loved. And he was just fortunate enough that Jesus loved him. So that's who he referred to himself. John uh, was reclining next to him. Simon Peter motioned to this disciple, to John, and said, ask him which one he means. Leaning back against Jesus... He, meaning John, asked him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, it is the one to whom I will give this piece of bread when I have dipped it in the dish. Then dipping the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, son of Simon. So you can see that is the event that's going on. You can see Peter talking to John, not Mary, right? Saying, saying ask him, who is it, right? And you could see the bread going there. A couple of other things I hope you can see. Judas' right hand is clutching a bag of money. Judas' right hand is clutching a bag of money. And there's something else here that just blows me away every time. I, I, I don't know if you can see it, but right here, Judas' right forearm is spilling the salt. Uh, and I don't know, my, my sainted mother, who's gone to be with Jesus now, uh, she had this terrible superstition about spilling the salt. Any of you know this? Right? You're supposed to take a pinch and throw it over one. Maybe it's the left shoulder. I don't even remember. Right? But th this originates all the way back into, I mean, salt was a form of payment sometimes in the first century. Uh, it was valuable, and you didn't want to spill it. Uh, a sailor sometimes was worth his salt, right? And that's how we would describe it, because it was a form of payment in lieu of cash at that point. But... In Da Vinci's time, it was, it was worse. This was not just like uh, Friday the 13th. Spilling the salt was a certain sign and omen that a curse from God was upon you and about to happen. Judas is spilling the salt. So there's so many neat things about this painting. I'm sorry if I spent too much time upon it, but it really does depict this exact verse 
that we're talking about today. And so we, we may come back and have a look at it later, but let's make sure we understand what our verses are describing for today. So back to the Bible for a minute, where we began in verse 19. And we had spent a lot of time getting to this. We had talked about the secret location that Jesus had for his Passover and how he was trying to get to this upper room, but, but he, was, he just sent John and Peter together, Batman and Robin of the New Testament, right? He sent them together because he wanted to keep it a secret from Judas so he wouldn't get, he, he wouldn't get arrested before that hour. And, and we talked a lot about the Passover and what that meant and how Jesus inserted himself into it. It's almost like he rewrote this 1,500-year-old tradition and showed that it was pointing to him. When he says in verse 19, and he took bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me, right? Uh, and, and, and he's saying this bread that you've broken for 1,500 years, th this, this is not representing leaven and running from Egypt. This is my body. And don't, I don't want you to worry about remembering about Moses and, and, and Egypt anymore. Do this in remembrance of me. And then in verse 20, he says, In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. See, and with those two verses that are just nuclear, Jesus completely fulfills a 1,500-year-old 100, 100 tradition. He doesn't, he doesn't nullify it. It's not invalid. It wasn't incorrect. He's just fulfilling it, and he's showing that it points to him. Is that wine you've been drinking? that you've been drinking to Elijah and you've assumed that for 1,500 years that it would bring about the Messiah, that's me. That's me. That's what you've been hoping for. And that wine represents something. It represents a new covenant, a new deal. No longer is the blood of a lamb put on your doorstep going to keep the angel of death from coming to your house. I am the lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And by appropriating if you choose to do so, my blood, death will not affect your soul. Your body may die, but your soul will not be subject to death. Amen? Right? And not only that, there's something else that we understand, which is that in the eyes of God, we get to be flawless somehow, even though we are flawed. It is though, as though Jesus will suffer the punishment for my life and I will enjoy the righteousness of his. And that's a good deal and we should take it and it's probably worth an amen. amen. Okay, that wasn't bad. And that's how verse 20 ended. And we think, man, isn't that, shouldn't that be the greatest celebration they ever had? But it's not because we live in a fallen world. And it's just, it, as an evidence of that, things, we have great times, and then just around the corner, we have rough times. Last Sunday, we were celebrating under clear skies and celebrating the word of the Lord together, openly, happily. And by the time the sun went down, we were hiding in shelters for our very lives, many of us. We live in a fallen world. And... Despite all the beauty of verses 19 and 20, verse 21 reflects that, right? This new thing is wonderful, but the hand of him who's going to betray me is, mine, is with mine on the table. Even in the midst of this beautiful thing, there's, there's the ugliness of our fallen world. And, and again, da Vinci painted the two hands literally on, ta on the table side by side. I don't think that was meant as literally as it meant uh, a figure of speech, this, whoever, this person who's dining with me. So when Jesus says the hand that is on the table with me, he's, probably ta he's talking about anyone that's having dinner here. And, and that's important because it, it, it created a chaos among the disciples. It would be as if in those old Hitchcock movies, right? One of you is a murderer. That's kind of the effect of this. It's, it's one of you eating with me tonight is going to betray me, right? Verse 22 that follows is one of the great mysteries of God. You may want to highlight it in your Bible. If you're ever troubled by this or you're trying to figure out how this works, just remember Luke 22, 22, okay? The Son of Man will go as it has been decreed, but woe to that man who betrays him. 
It's right in the middle of this. The hand of the person is going to betray me. And you know what? I'm going to go because that is the decree of God. And I'm in obedience to that. But this person who did it is still responsible for their actions. They, by a free will choice, chose to do it in such a way that they will be condemned. Woe to that man who betrays me. Matthew and Mark even add, it would be better for him if he had not been born. And you study the Bible long enough, you'll find that there's these, these two truths in it. One is that God decrees everything. God is sovereign. And there's nothing that can stop his plan from coming about. Amen? And I take some comfort in that. And if you were to read that the wrong way, though, you'd think, well, why is Judas being punished then? He was just carrying out the will. He's like a puppet. He's not responsible for what he's doing. But there's another truth that's as equally valid and as equally documented well in the Bible. Judas was responsible for his actions, and he made a free will choice for which he can be and will be condemned. Both are true, right? I don't know how. I know that's what you're going to ask. Because that's what I ask. I don't understand in my finite mind how both of those things can be true at times. But in the infinite mind of God, this is not a problem. God is the designer of all things and is sovereignly behind them to the point where we can celebrate that, we can worship that, we can take comfort in that. And yet, <laughs> and yet, somehow we are all responsible for our choices that we make. Amen? So if, you, if anyone ever asks you, how can those things be? Just say, I know it's true, Luke 22, 22. That's how I remember that. It's not, there's many more verses that describe it, but there's a perfect balance between that. Now we, who are watching this scene, we have the luxury of knowing that it's Judas is the betrayer, right? But I'd like to put yourself around that table for a minute and just think, if Jesus says one of you is going to betray me, what would your thoughts be? Well, in, in verse 23, you don't have to guess too long. They begin to question among themselves which of them it might be who would do this, right? Uh, it, so it, it has the effect of saying one of you is going to betray me, and it could be any of you. Now, we know it's Judas, so that we don't feel that. But around that table, they did. They felt that. In Matthew's gospel, and Mark has a verse very similar to this, they were very sad when they heard this and began to say to one another, surely not I, Lord. Now, I want you to think about that. It's not me, is it? I mean, why would you say that unless it, it could be me? It's not me. He doesn't think it's me, does it? Right? And this is the point. Very quickly, our own fear and our selfishness kicks in here. And this wonderful statement about the, 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 the atonement of Jesus decays into, well, he doesn't think I'm the one, does he? And why would you say that unless you actually thought it might be you? Right? And this is a really good reminder, brothers and sisters, and I count myself among you in this regard. And I'm sorry if, this is, if I'm breaking something to you here. We're all sinners. And if we know about our sin, we are capable of every sin in the book. I don't like having to tell you this. I don't. And sometimes people fight with me. Well, I could never really steal. I could never harm someone. Surely I would never betray Jesus. And again, I offer this in love as a patient in the same hospital. My beloved, I assure you on the word of God, each of you is capable of the worst in the right set of circumstances. Our hearts are darkened and black because we are separated from God. We are cursed in that way. And whatever you don't think you could ever do, you could in the right set of circumstances. If you need proof of this, this is not a happy book. But if you need proof of this, there's a book written in 1992 by a guy named Christopher Browning. It's called Ordinary Men. These were people that lived in Germany. This is about the German Reserve Police Battalion 101, right? And these were guys that were older. They're middle-aged, right? So they weren't drafted into the army. And they didn't have any necessarily uh, army experience. They weren't even really necessarily Nazis. These were middle-class guys. These were middle-aged guys. 
And they just happened to be, because they were not able-bodied enough to be in the regular army, they were in the reserve police force. They got called up, and within 30 days, a really short amount of time, these ordinary men committed some of the worst atrocities of World War II. And there's 200 or so of them that have testified to that, many of which confessing to that. And it is a, it's a really difficult book, but a great reminder. Please understand I'm in the same boat with you as a sinner. We're capable of every sin in the book. So Jesus tells them one of them's a betrayer. They selfishly first, they fear. I wonder if it's me. And then, you know, you think, oh my gosh, this is awful. And could it get any worse than this? Yeah, verse 24. Also, a dispute among, arose among them as to which of them was considered to be the greatest. Is, this, is that not just the worst that could happen at this moment? One of you is going to betray me. And I'm like, how could this happen? And, and I, you know, I've been praying and thinking about it. And I guess I, I could see it maybe happening this way. You know, they're just sitting. And now I can see it really clearly. They're sitting around. They're sinful people like me, okay? And there's 12 of them. And all of a sudden, was well, I'm not the one who's going to betray him. You might. You've never been as close to him as I have. Really? Uh, what about that trip up onto the mountain, right? You didn't make that. I was there. And then another one chimes in. Yeah, but he's always having to correct you. You're all just jealous of the relationship I have with him. Can you see this happening? I can. Unfortunately, right now I can see. I can actually see that from this beautiful news, we can descend into the ugliest, right? I fear the ugliest human bickering. And I think that if we look at da Vinci's painting one more time, I think that's one of the geniuses of him that he captures best in this. It's not just the shock. It's the bickering that results among them as to whom is the greatest. And this is why, to me, this is one of the most genius pieces of art. Is there anything more antithetical to the divine message of substitutionary atonement? I will give, even though I am God, I will give my life for you lowly people. Is there anything more antithetical to that, to have the lowly people argue among themselves who is greatest? And, and you know, it, before I sound like I'm lecturing on this, I'm so guilty of this, it makes me sick. I just, I just I, as I've been studying this, it's just been a, a week of repentance and weeping as I've seen myself do this in human situations, many of which in my past, thankfully. But, oh, it's just so awful. Luke has told us about this, but there's a better record. There's a couple of other records of the encounter that Jesus has with Judas. And at the risk here, I'm going to go ahead and share them with you. I don't think Luke is, is, I think Luke sometimes condenses things. Matthew and John give us a little bit more. In Matthew 26, 25, then Judas, the one who would betray him, said, Surely not I, Rabbi. And I don't even know how, how to say this. Sometimes we could read and understand with our mind. This is a verse I just don't even know how to interpret without my heart. Because Jesus loved this man. For three years he cared for me. I think he washed his feet at the beginning of this meal. Yeah, it's you. Yeah, it's you. With a broken heart. And I think that's reflected in John's account of this too. As soon as Judas took the bread, Satan entered into him. What you're about to do, do quickly, Jesus told him. You know, and, and we, we've heard that before, but it's, I, I've longed and prayed so long that you wouldn't do this. I maybe had hoped somehow that I could influence you not to. And you're going to do it anyway. Just do it quickly. The emotion of this is just staggering. It is interesting that Jesus told that to him, but no one at the meal understood why Jesus... See, maybe John and Peter were in on it, but the rest of the disciples didn't know it was Judas. When Judas got up to leave, since Judas had charge of the money, some thought Jesus was telling him to buy what was needed for the feast. See, they were in the first night of a seven-day feast. Maybe Jesus just sent him out. Or to give some to the poor. How's that for irony? 
He had them all so fooled. They thought the one who had Satan enter him to, de to betray Jesus was going to give money to the poor. Wow. As soon as Jesus, uh, this, this verse gets to me too. As soon as Judas had taken the bread, he went out and it was night. And John uses the symbol of night as a symbol of a total darkness. It's as, almost as if up until that moment, he might not have done this. But then he did, and as soon as he left, it was, his fate was sealed. It was over. Oh, boy. And the reactions of the apostles, and we're going to see some of these as we study Luke over the next few moments and the next few hours and maybe the next few days. Um, they offer us two choices. And by way of applications as we close, I guess this is, this is the part that I hope we can take something away from. I think the first choice that we have is to deny that we're capable of evil. To think that I could never do these things. Right? Insisting that we could never catch the virus, we die of the disease. Right? Or we can face the ugly fact that each of those other 11 guys knew in their hearts they could have betrayed Jesus and you and I must confess the fact that we could have done it as well. We can look at that ugliness of just the sin that we know we commit, not even the ones that the Lord has protected us from knowing, and realize it's just the tip of an iceberg of an ugliness of what we're capable of. And here's the beauty. Because we know we are guilty or could be guilty of these things, we throw ourselves on the mercy of God. And instead of facing punishment, the beauty is that the sincere plea of guilty from the broken, humble person is met with grace. It's met with forgiveness. It's met with open, loving arms. And in the poverty of our spirit, we're offered the richest blessing of forgiveness, acceptance, and love. <laughs> See, God loves you. He's loved you since the moment he created you. He wants to have a relationship with you. And this blackness in our heart is in the way of it. But he's worked out a way by the already finished work of Jesus that can be offered on our behalf that our sincere repentance can appropriate that blood of the lamb for us. And we don't have to bear the guilt, the shame, the sorrow, because we were never meant to. You know, guilt is like a trash pile that builds up outside of your soul. And, and, you know, we might recognize sometimes that we've done something wrong, but we really, I mean, we might try and pay somebody back, you know, but really, there's no way to get rid of guilt. So many of the psychoses of our age are an inability to get rid of guilt that comes from the fact that we are human. Apart from the atoning work of Jesus Christ, guilt cannot be dealt with properly, period. Time and time again, the Bible teaches this. So, today, will you choose, please, to admit not just the guilt that you're guilty of, like me, but the potential of the guilt within you, like me, every time I drive. And we admit our guilt and the possibility of our evil before God. And we watch it removed as far as the east is from the west. Let's pray. Father, we rest in the promise that you are faithful and you will forgive those who sincerely confess and repent. We know we are capable of evil. And we pray you forgive us for our tainted hearts and that you deliver us from evil. We freely accept the miracle of Christ's atonement for us. We lay our sins and our burdens at the foot of the cross. And Lord Jesus, having died to bring us peace, please help us through your Holy Spirit to be free of guilt and full of gratitude. Help us to live as righteously as you died to make us. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. It happened.
happened so long ago I cried out for mercy back then I pled the blood of Jesus I begged him to forgive my sin But I just can't forget it It just won't go away So I wept again Lord, wash my sins And this is all he'd say What sin What sin that's as far away as the east is from the west What sin, what sin It was gone the very minute you confessed Buried in the sea of forgetfulness thing we'll carry is a load of guilt and shame you were never meant to bear them so let them go in Jesus name our God is slow to anger but quick to forgive our sin so let him put them under the blood don't bring them up again or he'll just say as far away as the east is from the west what sin what sin it was gone the very minute you confessed buried in the sea of forgetfulness Great to have Robinson for us. Thank you, Robin. Thank you so much. God bless you guys.